Right, good, good day everyone. Uh, just to let everyone know that I am recording the meeting so uh, that everything you say will be attributed to your digital history. We do publish and share uh, the recording for everyone, so I just want everyone to be aware that, that we are recording. Um, we may as well get started, um, and as people uh, pop in, uh, we, uh, they can just pick up from where we are. So let me just get this, let me start sharing going. That should be coming through now. Okay, well, given that we are a, a smaller group today, it, uh, it would be good to just accommodate a couple of quick uh, introductions. I wonder if I should maybe just start with Rajiv first, because I know he's in, in the process of driving. I might be getting out of his car soon. So, Rajiv, you just want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Wayne. Um, I'm Rajiv Jangiani. I'm the Associate Vice Provost for Open Education at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in British Columbia. Happy to join you all this, this afternoon. Yes, and, and Rajiv, a huge big thank you for offering to assist us in shaping the agenda for the first day uh, for the, you know, the symposium piece. Uh, we are very grateful for your gift of knowledge and time. Um, so Happy I'm, to. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm just going to move down the list uh, in the order I have it here. Adrian, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much, Wayne. My name is Adrian Stagg. I'm the Manager Open Educational Practice with the University of Southern Queensland and uh, very glad to be here. Thank you, Adrian. It's good to have a couple of folk from across the ditch, as always. Um, next on my list, I have uh, Darian. Hi, yes. Good morning, evening all. Uh, Darian Rossiter, uh, RMIT. I am the um, project lead, the initiative lead for the micro-credentialing 21cc initiative here at RMIT. And um, very glad to say hello again, Wayne, and to meet the group. Likewise, and uh, Darian, you guys are really doing some interesting stuff around micro-credentialing, and it's wonderful to have you here with us today. Thank you. Uh, going Thank back you. across the ditch now to Christchurch, uh, Dave. Hello all. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yep, yep. Sorry. Hello all. I'm I'm uh, one of oh, well. I think I'm the only if other full time uh, colleague of Wayne's, um, and I'm working as the open source technologist for the OER Foundation from Christchurch. So I, I uh, am, despite my American accent, joining you from uh, the South Island of New Zealand. Kia ora, Dave. Thanks. Uh, next on my list, uh, going back to Oz, uh, David Gibson from Curtin. Great to have you here, David. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Wayne. It's good to be here with the group again. I'm the director of learning teachers at Curtin University. With, uh, a lot of similar uh, kinds of activities, making education as open as possible. And I'm uh, pleased to be part of the group. Cheers. Thanks, David. Uh, and going back now to Canada, uh, Kirk, I'm not sure if you're in Vancouver at the moment. Oh, looks like uh, Kurt doesn't have his um, microphone activated, so I'm just going to skip Kurt for the moment and uh, go. But inland in BC, Mike Looney. Yeah, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, Mike Looney. I'm the Open Learning Program Coordinator for the Faculty of Arts at Thompson Rivers University. Um, it's good to see everyone. Yeah, and big thanks for all the heavy lifting you guys have been doing around the uh, credit transfer stuff for the Certificate of General Studies, much appreciated. Yeah, we're pretty much good to go on that. So um, we've got, um, well, more than 30 credits now assessed and uh, ready for transfer. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And uh, next on the list, uh, uh, Val, back in Oz, I assume. Yes, I'm still here, at least until December. Thank you, Wayne. Um, I'm Val Peachy, the Acting Director for the Learning Online Unit and Professor of Open Education at Charles Sturt. Great. Thanks very much, Val. So I've got, I, I posted the agenda in the wiki as we always do. Uh, for those of you that have been with the OERU for uh, a wee while, you, you know that we are a radically open and transparent organization. We conduct all our planning openly. Uh, we are very proud of our history since our inception in 2011. 
we have public records of every meeting that the OERU has conducted, including recordings. So uh, we're continuing that, that tradition. What we also do each year in preparation for our international meeting of OERU partners is host an open consultation on shaping that agenda for our meeting. So that's the purpose of today's activities. I, I also want to just give a brief update on some of the things that we've been, been busy with, uh, particularly for folk who uh, are not that up to date with where we are at uh, with our initiatives. So the first part of the meeting, uh, just a quick succinct update of what we've been up to. Um, and then we'll move into the agenda consultation piece. Um, I should mention this is a wiki, so even after the meeting, if you do want to add any points or discuss any items further, please do so. Uh, you know, just create an account on the wiki, we'll approve that, and you're more than welcome to uh, join in the conversation. So let me just leave the brainstorming ideas for a moment. We've done the welcome and introductions. Uh, a brief update on the implementation of the first year of study. As you know, we are, have assembled a range of micro courses uh, that will articulate into two designated qualifications at the OERU. Uh, the one is the Certificate of Higher Education Business that will be conferred by uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands in Scotland. And then the second is the Certificate of General Studies, which will be conferred by Thompson Rivers University. So just a, a quick overview of the, plat the OERU platform for those that aren't familiar with how, how things have panned out. Uh, we publish uh, all our course courses on a, a WordPress site. Um, all the course materials reside uh, on the course sites. You know, learners can navigate through the learning pathways. Um, the interesting piece in all of this is the fact that all the authoring of all OERU content is done um, in Wiki Educator. Let me just uh, move my GDPR compliance. Um, and at the bottom of any page of any of our course materials, you can actually click through to the source uh, of the materials where we actually do all the authoring, which is in the Wiki. And we do this for a number of reasons. The most important, of course, is uh, version control for collaborative authoring, um, but also ensuring consistent semantic markup of the content. And having a consistent markup of the content enables us to automate a number of processes to be able to publish uh, OERU learning materials. And so we've got a bunch of scripts that run that then publish the course uh, websites which we use for the individual courses. The other interesting piece in all of this, I should possibly just open this graphic here. Um, is our distributed uh, ecosystem. So if we just... So rather than uh, having all our courses residing within a learning management system, we uh, select best of breed open source technologies which are distributed on the web for learner interactions. I'm not gonna go through each one of them, but we have a whole range of uh, technologies to support discussion forums, our social media website, learners can maintain their own blogs. Uh, we of course use the uh, hypothesis annotation engine. Um, and where the magic really happens is the syndication to generate a course feed from all those individual sources that are distributed on the web. And in fact, this is a, a cohort course of uh, Leader 103, the uh, copyright and open licensing course, which is running now at the moment as a cohort. And here you can see the uh, uh, course feed, the timeline, uh, interactions that have come through from comments from the course site. You'll see here is a post from one of the learners on their, pers their personal blog. Um, here's an annotation that's come in from Hypothesis. So you get the idea. We have these technologies that are distributed on the web. We are able to uh, harvest any of these interactions that are tagged with the course code. And that's more or less how everything is put together in terms of the back end. Um, what I also want to highlight um, is some of the 
what uh, for co course inter all right so a, a couple of things um our course websites we do not require learners to register on any of the course sites in order to participate in any, any of our oeru courses all course materials are available for all learners without the need to register an account and that's kind of quite important to us uh, because if we hide our course materials behind a password per definition they closed right but we do offer learners the opportunity to register to receive uh, course instructions via email and also to be able to participate in any of the interaction technologies. Um, and so we use a piece of marketing automation software called Mortic, um, which is the back end for automating all the email instructions that go out. Um, and just by way of indication, um, I've just pulled this graph, which is uh, one of the dashboard interfaces on our Mortic website. And the graph that I'm showing you there are the, uh, is the cumulative number of emails that are going out each month. And you can see early in, in the year, January, February, you know, roughly about 400 or 500 emails a month. Uh, but you can see as we're starting to roll out more courses, um, that you know, the number of emails that are going out each month are increasing. And you can see that that graph is showing characteristics of exponential growth, which has been a primary focus of what we've been doing at the back end at the OERU to make sure our technologies, our systems and pedagogical approaches are set up to be able to scale up uh, as these numbers grow. I mean, currently at the moment, we are sending out between 1,000 to 1,500 course instruction emails a day uh, for the few courses we have up and running at the moment. So a lot of focus and energy uh, this year has gone into uh, preparing for that scalability. And, and so, for example, I can show you how this works. Learners can engage or register uh, for courses from uh, different places. Uh, this is the landing page on the OERU course website, right? Uh, which advertises the four micro courses that are available for the learning in the digital age series. Learners at, at this point can uh, say, well, hey, I'm, you know, I'm interested in doing Leader 101. I want to quickly sign up here. If they click on that link, they are taken to a landing page, which is on our Mortic website, gives a brief summary of the course. Learners can register. And that, that is one of the ways in which learners can register to engage in courses. Alternatively, uh, if they want, uh, you know, they can start learning straight away because we don't re require registration in order to engage in the course materials. That link takes them directly through to the course website and they can start learning straight away. But if they wanted to register to receive course emails, uh, we have technologies here from the WordPress website where they can actually register uh, to receive course email instructions and participate in course comments on the course website. So I'm just illustrating that the different uh, websites where uh, learners can uh, register, so to speak, if they want to, to engage in, uh, you know, the, the, you know, engage in learning. But that, of course, adds layers of complexity. Uh, we have to design the back ends to be able to accommodate these different communication campaigns. Um, and um, here is just an example of uh, the logic which we use on the back end in Mortic to manage these campaigns. And I'm not going to go through the detail here. We'll look at this in greater depth at the partners meeting. But you can see there's quite a bit of you know, logic uh, happening on the back end, depending on where a learner comes in to register and the preferences that they express in terms of how they want to engage in the learning uh, in terms of how these campaigns are managed. We are also able to accommodate both cohort instances as well as independent study instances, right? A cohort being a, a course that will have a fixed start date and a fixed finish date versus independent study where learners can start at any time. And so the campaigns also have logic to be able to manage that interface between cohort-based learning as well as independent study learning. 
And it can get quite complicated because you've got all these issues. Somebody might say, oh, I want to register for the cohort starting on the, you know, the 20th of October. And on you know, the 12th of October, they, they decide they want to now start with independent study. So the system has got to have the knowledge and know-how to avoid duplicating emails for somebody who registers for independent study before they've actually st start a cohort instance for which they've signed up for. So a lot of work this year has been going into um, getting those back ends ready for scalability. That's all I wanted to do by a way of just uh, an update of what we've been doing on the back end uh, with some of the design work. Um, this year, we also launched the OERU Outreach Partnership Initiative. I mean, OERU was established as a philanthropic collaboration to widen access to more affordable education, particularly learners in the developing world who, for lack of funding or lack of uh, seats in their home countries could participate in higher education. And at the last meeting of the Council of Chief Executive Officers, we decided to implement the OBRU outreach program where institutions in low and lower middle income countries, according to the World Bank uh, classification, plus all small island nations with a population of less than 5 million people, in the developing world could join the OERU outreach partners, or could join the OERU as participating partners without having to pay membership fees. So we launched this program uh, this year. Uh, it's, it's proving uh, to be quite popular with a number of institutions. We have this, uh, an MOU which is set up, which uh, you know, describes exactly what we're doing and how we're going to do it. And we are, uh, have a number of partners from India as well as uh, two institutions from Africa. And this is an initiative which is slowly growing. And it's proving to be quite successful in helping us reach learners in the audiences we're aiming to serve. Um, our last cohort of learning in a digital age, we had about 800 uh, participants from 60 plus countries. Um, what is interesting, 60% uh, of learners who registered for the last cohort of learning in the digital age will reside in developing countries. Um, and we are very excited with those figures, uh, which are significantly higher than our corporate competition in, of like the Future Learns and the Coursera's of this world. So we are quite excited about that. Uh, the other bit of news, uh, we, we are very proud to have received the Commonwealth of Learning Award for Excellence in Distance Education Materials this year for the Learning in the Digital Age courses. Uh, where we're at in terms of our strategic targets at the last partners meeting, uh, we aimed to register 5,000 learners uh, as we you know, start gearing up. Before the year is out, we are currently, as of today, 5,109 unique uh, registrations. Uh, and that will climb a little before the end of the year. And as I mentioned earlier, um, more than half of the participants uh, signing up are, you know, reside in the developing part of the world. So that's all in terms of my brief update. We'll unpack this in more detail at the partners meeting, but maybe I could just stop there if there are any questions from anybody in the group. Any questions or comments? And in true tradition to uh, our OERU meetings, we'll take silence to mean assent. I, I, I think somebody was wanting to say something. Did I hear something? Wayne, this is, uh, this is David Gibson. I just want oh. to congratulate you. It's been a while since I checked in on progress and at the time we met at Hobart, which was probably three years ago, I think we had one student in the world at that point in time. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, uh, tremendous progress. Congratulations. Thank, thank you very much, David. Thank you kindly. I mean, I think one of the things that characterizes the work of the OERU is the rigor of our planning. And uh, a large part of our effort has also been invested in the transnational uh, accreditation. 
So all OVLU courses have been assembled as micro courses. Uh, so learners can earn micro credentials, but each micro course actually articulates into transcript credit towards the designated um, OVLU qualifications. So, I mean, I think that's been a, a big achievement for us as well, because, you know, there's, there's a lot of devil in that detail, uh, you know, figuring out that transnational micro-credentialing piece. So, uh, we're very excited about that component of the work as well. Any other thoughts? Contributions? If not, I will hand the floor over to David. Uh, to Dave, sorry. <laughs> There's a Freudian right. slip there. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, all. Um, I'm just going to give a quick uh, report, uh, a little bit more of the kind of technology underpinning of, of all of these um, services that we're um, talking about that Wayne has just showed you some of. Um, uh, so I've been busy, uh, given that this is now, this is my full-time role, I've been busy all this past year um, working on these different um, technologies and, and making sure that they're reliable and um, ideally scalable and um, reproducible so that we can hopefully not only create a service that others can use, but demonstrate that, uh, create a service that others could replicate and actually copy what we're doing if they so, if they so choose, especially some of our um, outreach partners, uh, we could potentially make use of the same infrastructure in their own countries. Um, I just wanted to say that we have uh, developed successfully in this past year a um, nice integration behind the scenes for new learners who subscribe uh, or enroll in courses um, so that they're automatically uh, entered into the appropriate Mautic um, system that will update them with course uh, instructions and so on in a timely timely manner according to the very um, impressive uh, logical leaps that Wayne has made so Wayne I think is probably the world expert on on how to use the Mautic rules system but we've now set it up so that the WordPress and uh, um, Mautic are, are fairly tightly integrated um, that that these are by the way all of the the strategic software development that we've done is all open source as well and it is all available if any of you have interest in exploring it further. Um, we also developed a, uh, a WordPress plugin designed to improve uh, the ease with which new learners could register. So uh, Wayne, I don't know if you could maybe display yeah. that. Um, I mean, you could, yeah, it's probably easier for you to do it there. Uh, the demos that I've got a link to, or, or, or there as well, yep. So you can see here, Wayne, Wayne briefly um, showed this. this. This allows a new learner to either register or log in. Uh, and the idea is that it also gives very um, good feedback to the learner if they're putting in information that's maybe not appropriate or, or you know, they, they're putting in information that doesn't, um, they, they mix up the kind of information they need to put in different places and it will, it will give them useful instructions and it's designed to give uh, it's designed on the philosophy that every action gain gives them positive or, or, or clear negative feedback, depending on what they're trying to do. Um, you can also see here that uh, you have the ability just from the same kind of control area to enroll or unenroll in courses. You can adjust your password and so on, the kinds of things that you would need to do, um, as a learner uh, so that you can control your experience and have full control of your private, your, your private information. So we're, we're, we only collect a minimum of private information in any case, but it, this, the idea is to make it really easy for people to do the things they need to do uh, without having to hunt around the website to do so. Um, we've also created a, uh, you may recall, I think we mentioned it the past, partner meeting a blog feed finding tool which is used uh, Wayne mentioned before that in our we notes system for for dynamic feeds for each course that a um, learner can subs or can submit a blog of their own personal blogs URL and they can actually um, sub uh, provide a blog feed uh, URL that is a blog feed address um, so that their blog will be periodically scanned and any, um, any blog posts that they have tagged with a course code that they're enrolled in will then be recruited into the system uh, and, and included in the blog feed. Um, 
or sorry, the course feed for their course. But uh, the big problem we found that learners had was they, they, they didn't know what a blog feed was and um, they didn't know how to find it. So we created a tool that allows them to put in the address of their blog and it will then provide them with their blog feed URL. And if they're logged into the site, it will allow them simply to associate that feed with a particular course they're logged into. Now you can see Wayne is registered for a whole bunch of courses or enrolled in a whole bunch of courses. So he can, he can assign that blog feed to whatever course he's already in. So you could have the single blog that, that might be used in the context of different courses that you're enrolled in. Or you could have an individual blog just for a given course. So in any case, the idea is to give a very, um, it also is designed as a learning opportunity. So you'll see that it provides you with useful instructions or, or feedback. And if you, if you hover over the eye, it gives you additional information about what's actually going on behind the scenes so that you can gain insight should you choose to as a learner. So that's uh, another teaching moment opportunity. Um, we've also done quite a few upgrades to our snapshotting process, which Wayne also alluded to, where uh, the course development in the Wiki Educator context results then in courses that are automatically um, snapshotted and presented in the form of a uh, mobile friendly WordPress site. So you've seen the course sites and you've seen the, um, the Wiki Educator side of it where the version control, for example, is, is provided. We've in enhanced that process now to include the ability to, uh, one, of our, one of our partners was very keen on in introducing a course that had content hosted on their own servers. So they wanted the ability to include iframed content. Now we've added a template that allows them to do that. And while we were there, we also saw that it was possible to include content using the H5P learning objects um, vocabulary, or the, the, there's, a, there's a whole technology of, of um, learning objects that can be, that can be created in, independently, and you can then reference them uh, from wherever they happen to be hosted on the web, and they can be recruited into your uh, course materials if you're, if you're compiling a course. Um, so so our, our learning um, snapshot process now supports the introduce, introduction or inclusion of H5P components. Um, so we see that as being a, a huge opportunity to improve the richness of, of the learning experience. Um, and uh, just um, some other kind of back-end information. Uh, we've also um, shifted all of our systems to using something called Docker as a way of managing the, uh, the hosting of all these different solutions. And that... Um, gives us a whole bunch of, of advantages. It means that we can rapidly replicate any systems that we have for testing purposes um, or to make it easy for partners, for example, to deploy the same technologies in their own institutional context if they so choose. It also means that we have a platform on which we can scale out our own services. So if it turns out that our course site, for example, is not performing well because there's of, of the weight of, of, of learner interactions, we can actually expand uh, or broaden out the support um, just simply by adding um, hosting resources to it and increase the capacity of our, of our own services. So all of the open source technologies that we have adopted for our learning systems are um, tested at internet scales. So many of these technologies, which currently might only have a few thousand learners involved, in theory can support millions of learners. Um, so uh, they've all been tested in other contexts with other, you know, by other people, um, but with those kinds of loads. So we are confident that we have um, a lot of headroom when it comes to increasing our uh, capacity and, and handling exponential growth. And finally, we've, um, we've uh, done a fair bit of shuffling around, um, taking advantage of this, uh, the, the mobility that we have with using Docker. We've shuffled around a lot of our services. Um, we've, we've dropped our use of Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure, which are both extraordinarily expensive for what they do. And we've shifted to um, uh, other infrastructure, uh, including a, a company called DigitalOcean, who provide um, hosting infrastructure at about an eighth of the cost for equivalent systems to either Azure or, or um, Amazon Web Services. So we are able to 
increasing or we're able to actually reduce our already incredibly low <laughs> Um, infrastructure costs uh, by making those changes and we're able to do that those switches very rapidly and with minimal uh, interruption to any of our services there you go Th thanks very much Dave and of yeah, course yeah. I'll, open, I'll open up the floor to anybody who's got any questions or comments to make and I might even just call on Rajiv because I bet, uh, you had a very interesting idea as to how you uh, could integrate H5P uh, within your psychology course that you uh, are polishing. <coughs> Sorry for putting you on the spot, Rajiv. Uh, yeah, no worries at all. Sorry, I'm just uh, disentangling over here. It kills kids running around. Um, uh, yeah, so I think we would we were thinking about uh, 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 embedding an open pedagogy uh, assignment in the course, whereby students are, in fact, uh, uh, authoring. Um, some multiple choice questions as part as a, as a learning activity in the course um, and potentially considering the use of um, H5P as one of the ways in which um, students can construct questions using H5P technology using the multiple choice application and submit the H5P file, for example. Um, so that's not the only use case, I think, but, but certainly that's one that we were thinking about. Yeah, Very which cool. I thought it's a pr pretty neat use case because, uh, you know, learners could, you know, uh, create an account on the community H5P site, develop their object, um, and the technology is designed in such a way that you can download the objects. Mm -hmm. So um, that kind of standards-based, you know, uh, interaction and reuse is potentially very, very powerful for, for the things that we're doing here. And, you know, I, you know, it, it, I can see how this open pedagogy approach can benefit OVRU because learners could actually develop interactive items for integration in future OVRU courses uh, and actually yep. see the, you know, the, the fruits of their labors being put to good use. Yeah. You know, real, real world uh, contexts. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, just to, just to add to that, uh, I think part of the idea was, was also you can always take uh, some of the questions and embed them. In fact, in uh, updated uh, revisions of the course, at least as formative questions, if not more. Um, and of course, the the lovely learning principle is that students have to understand the concept quite deeply uh, in order to author plausible distractors. So there's quite a bit of scaffolding and. and um, training that that takes place and this is an assignment that we've actually deployed face to face in the classroom at KPU so uh, but translating it using the flexibility of this uh, open format I think would be quite neat yeah uh, it's very powerful if, you know if you want to learn something teach it eh? yeah hey, uh, Rajiv and Wayne I just thought I'd mention that we we're also we've also created a companion to the course website which is the h5p authoring website um, which at the moment is still in its early early stages of, of kind of uh, polish, but the idea would be that people who are building H5P or wanting to build H5P components for their uh, OERU related courses could do so using our infrastructure without having the um, barrier of having to sift or you know figure out exactly where to create their own components um, without having you know they, it reduces the overheads or the barriers to to um, making use of the H5P system. So we've already got that authoring environment set up now. Any other thoughts, comments, or contributions from the floor? And in true uh, OERU tradition, we'll take silence to mean assent, which means you are all in total agreement with what we're doing. Um, great. Okay, so uh, let, let's move on to the next uh, item on the agenda, which is to have the consultation on the agenda for the OERU partners meeting on the 30th and the 31st of October in Dublin. So a little bit of background to this. Um, at the previous meeting uh, in Port, Port Macquarie in Australia, uh, there was some discussion, in fact, uh, President Alan Davis from KPU suggested that the partner meeting itself, where we do all the planning and decision making, uh, could be uh, consolidated into a single day meeting. Um, and to be honest, I, you know, given the 
the, the developmental state and the maturation of OERU, the nature of the planning work that we are doing now as we are implementing the, you know, the, these programs for OERU is very different to what it was 10 years ago when we were trying to figure out how to make this all work. So I think there's a lot of merit in, you know, consolidating and focusing the planning component to a single day, but then also to utilize the other day for meaningful engagement within the partner network. And so the current thinking is that we would use the first day as a kind of symposium. I'm not sure if that's a correct label, but to have the first day as a, a place where uh, partners and observers who are attending the meeting to share their experiences around what they are doing in the open education space uh, as an opportunity to network and see how that might interface or inform some of the work we're doing within the OERU. Um, the other idea, of course, is we could in fact model some open pedagogy stuff by having a short session where, for example, participants could develop some H5P objects that could actually be used in uh, OERU courses under development uh, as another potential idea. So I'm just putting it out there at this stage. Uh, first, an, an open discussion. What do you think about allocating you know, the first day to the symposium networking uh, concept? So I'm gonna open the floor there. Any thoughts, contributions? Objections? Wayne, it's Val. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea to use the first day because you're gonna have people there that maybe don't all know each other. So to use the idea of um, <clears throat> bridging that sort of gap from people who know each other and institutions that are familiar with each other's work to those that aren't so familiar would be a yeah. sort of a great part of the first agenda anyway. Yeah, oh, you, you're absolutely right, Val. Um, at each meeting, it's one of the challenges is, um, you know, we have folk who have attended every single OERU meeting since inception to uh, you know, new partners and observers who are there and kind of getting everybody on the same page, uh, you know, is, imp is important. Um, and that's why I'm kind of had this bullet here, you know, maybe just do the quick overview timeline of what OERU has done, maybe, you know, 15, 20 minutes to sort of bring people up to speed as to where we're at before we sort of move into the networking piece. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Val. Darren, did, did you want to take the mic? Yes, I was going to come in, but I think um, I'm just really echoing Val's sentiment there. Um, certainly for myself and, and others, I think um, the opportunity to, um, to meet and also to sort of share or even sort of showcase uh, some of the work that we're all doing, I think is a really lovely introduction and a way to kind of spark ideas and, um, and good, good dialogue. Yeah, thanks for that, Darren. Uh, any other thoughts? Uh, I mean, one of the questions, I've added a couple of bullets here, the kinds of things that could be incorporated on the first day. Are there any other bullets or any other ideas we could uh, potentially build into uh, that first day? Um, yeah, David, it's Rajiv. Just to build on the idea of working, um, we've been facilitating a, a lot of different um, sprint format events to develop uh, OER and related ancillary resources at KPU. Uh, and we found it to be a, a fairly effective format when you have uh, a group of people together for a short space of time. Um, so I just wanted to offer that um, as, a, as a, a potential facilitation and planning. If we, if we have yeah. targets of what we want to do ahead of time, we can plan for that. I, I, I think that's an excellent idea, Rajiv, and um, I'm, I'm counting on you to help me sh shape uh, that part of the agenda uh, as, we, as we build it and your experience in actually running some of these sprints uh, would be invaluable. You know, we could even have a mini sprint around sort of the H5P type of objects because they, they're quite focused. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it's not like developing a textbook, if you see what I'm saying. You know, it's a very focused activity. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Thanks, Val. Uh, Adrian, you, you have your hand up? 
Uh, yes, Wayne. Uh, one of the things that I think has been really handy in the, the previous partners meetings has been um, sort of the, the history of the OERU, where, where it is going. Uh, the one thing that I'd be very interested in seeing is from those who are attending, um, how does the OERU align with or integrate with what they are doing at an institutional level and what kinds of things are each institution uh, looking for uh, in terms of taking out of the network? Because I think that if we can understand people's rationale and what they're looking for by joining the network, it might actually help us as individual partners uh, locate, um, locate some people who have similar ideologies or similar desired outcomes, and we could get some good collaboration that way. Again, Adrian, um, an, an excellent suggestion. And I, I think that is something that should definitely be integrated into the meeting. That could maybe be one of the focused planning uh, activities on the second day. Uh, I've, I mean, looking from the outside in, you know, our perspective of the OERU network is, is perhaps a little different from what a partner sees. And one of the glaring gaps uh, in the OERU network is what I can loosely term the return on investment component. Uh, I mean, there, there are a number of assets within the OERU network which could add tremendous value to individual partners without much effort. And we're not seeing a lot of that activity ha happening within the network. And so maybe to have a bit of that conversation to see, uh, you know, what comes out, you know, where, where are the matches, where are the opportunities, how do we fill these gaps? Um, uh, because it would be relatively trivial to generate value in excess of the 4,000 US dollars membership fee by you know, reusing or you know, integrating something that the OERU can give for nothing. You see, you see what I'm saying? So and I think that's a, a, a very import, important conversation to have. Yeah, totally agree. Thanks for that, Adrian. Any other thoughts? Folk who've attended previous OERU meetings. Um, do you think this is a better format? Um, things that we might have missed in the past. Again, I'm going to take silence to mean assent. So based on the, um, the halls of silence, uh, I'm going to propose that uh, Rajiv, and I, Rajiv and I start working on this agenda now. We'll, we'll uh, collate the agenda in one of the, the open spaces we have and start shaping this into uh, the meeting agenda. Uh, of course, if anybody thinks of anything after the meeting or you would like to add uh, an additional point, we will be using an open environment for this. So at any time while we're drafting this, this, this process and shaping the agenda, you're most welcome to make contributions. But I'm, I'm hearing a fair level, uh, amount of consensus around sort of the broad structure which we want to use to uh, shape the agenda. Uh, is that a fair assessment? Uh, Wayne, it's Val. Yeah. Can I just? Yeah. Um, I, I'm just wondering, as another um, item for the agenda for the meeting, if um, you know, we need to consider about expanding the partnership. I don't know whether that's on the cards necessary. You know, of, of permanent members, whether yeah. that's something that. Yeah. And if so, what the strategies might be. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, you I feel comfortable. Yeah, I totally agree, Bill. Um, we, we need to have that strategic conversation at the meeting in terms of expanding the network. Also in the context of how the OERU, part, uh, OERU Outreach Partnership Initiative is expanding, uh, which yeah. adds a very interesting dimension um, you know, to what we're doing. At, at one level, uh, you know, the contribution to the OERU network is a tangible commitment 
to the community service mission that all our public funded institutions have, uh, you know, in, in helping institutions who, for whatever reason, uh, are struggling with impl you know, implementing OER in different parts of the world. But at the same time, we need to think about, you know, how do we expand the network of act contributing partners, fiscal, you know, fiscally contributing partners. I mean, OERU is a unique network uh, in, in this space, uh, given that we are entirely, uh, you know, based on OER and open source technologies, to the best of my knowledge, there isn't another international <coughs> network that is, you know, doing it in the way we're doing it. And then also no, the, the, the whole micro-credentialing piece that's sitting in there. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I think that's an excellent suggestion, Val. You wanted to say? I was just going to say as well, I don't know whether in that meeting we'd want to look at um, some st uh, strategies and objectives for the coming year if we're going to put that to the CEOs on the, on the next day. Recommendations, yep. you know, like set some goals. Yep. Yes, we, we will uh, incorporate, because in previous meetings, we've had that strategy through each of the sort of mini breakout planning sessions. That's right. That, that uh, participants can add uh, issues uh, for the CEO's meeting. And, I, I, you know, we will continue that uh, approach because it actually works well, you know, to feed into the CEO's meeting. So, yes, definitely. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Val. Any other thoughts and uh, contributions? So I'm not hearing anything anymore, so we'll move forward on that basis. And so just the last item today, is there uh, anything else you'd like to add to the agenda? Any other points of discussion? No, that's that sound. That sounds good. I, I have to say, it's uh, it's truly a pleasure to work with a team like this who can uh, get a meeting done within the hour. I'm I'm impressed. <laughs> okay, so if there, if there are no additional comments or thoughts, uh, Rajiv and I will move forward and shape that agenda in consultation with you in sort of the open spaces. And from my desk, a, a big, big thank you for your gift of time uh, to help us in you know, putting this agenda together for the partners meeting. Thank you. And with that, we'll adjourn. Thank you. <laughs>